So, all right, thanks everyone for your patience, appreciate it. So, um, so last November, we had a, a great turnout uh, when uh, at our November webinar, when Chris walked us through the NIH SBIR Omnibus Open Solicitation and sharing insights on how to best utilize this opportunity. So now this month, she's gonna dive a little deeper on understanding NIH study sessions, sections, excuse me, and the NIH SBIR STTR review and resubmission process. So I'm glad you're very, I'm very glad that you're here today. I can't seem to get my words together. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> but I'm very glad that you joined the Illinois FAST Center today. We're very happy to provide free resources throughout the state of Illinois to um, technology startups that are, are ready to prepare drafts and submit applications for SBIR and STTR funding. So we can provide a little bit more information about how to access those resources in the chat. And for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um, as Sherry mentioned, this is sort of a continuation of a previous um, webinar that we focused on covering the overall um, annual NIH omnibus solicitation. So today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into those um, into looking at uh, study sections. Um, I'm gonna talk about the peer review process so you can understand what happens during that time when your application is submitted and you're waiting to hear. Um, and then I'll talk about interpreting your results and touch on the process of resubmission. This is not an introductory level workshop. Um, this is going to focus on the NIH process and for individuals, it's best suited for individuals who have some experience navigating the process or are getting ready to. And so you can understand what's gonna to happen to your application in the process. If you have questions throughout, I'll stop periodically and ask Sherry if there's any questions in the chat. So feel free to, to um, pop those in the chat. So first I wanna give you just an overview of what happens to your application after you submit it. Um, you're either gonna prepare your application in grants.gov or I recommend in NIH's platform called ASSIST, which you access via ERA Commons. Once you submit your application, um, it's going to be received and validated by NIH in ERA Commons. After a certain period of time, they then ship your application over to the Center for Scientific Review. The Center for Scientific Review takes over from this point forward. They will again review your application and they will make an assignment of your application to a particular institute or center within NIH. And then they will make an assignment to a study section. We previously talked about institutes and centers in the first part of this workshop. Today, we're gonna to sort of hone in on that study section assignment. And all of that uh, takes place over several months. NIH has three standard due dates, September 5th, January 5th, and April 5th. And you can see here how things move through the process. Um, so if you submit for that recent January 5th submission deadline, um, your proposal will be reviewed in the peer review process in between February and March. You will receive your results in between March and April. If you have a score that appears to be fundable, and we'll look at what those scores look like, you will get that second mm -hmm. level of review in May or June, and then you would expect funding um, in July at the earliest. So it's a very long process. So let's look at study sections. So study sections are uh, a function of the Center for Scientific Review. Um, the Center for Scientific Review is responsible for reviewing about 75% of NIH's applications. And you will know whether they're reviewing the applications or whether the institute or center is handling that um, through information in the funding opportunity announcement or the, the um, FOA for that individual solicitation. If you're doing omnibus, your application is gonna go to CSR. Um, the point of CSR is that it removes the application from the, the part of NIH that makes the funding decision. So it kind of creates a, a separation. Um, when your application is submitted to NIH, as we saw, it goes to, ERA, to NIH to, through ERA Commons for validation, then it's sent to CSR. When it's at CSR, it's completely out of the hands of the institute or center. It gets reviewed and then it goes 
back to the Institute or Center once the review process is complete. Um, so that's the full cycle. It goes away to CSR and then it comes back. And when it comes back, it's done. <clears throat> They're the ones that are going to assign your application to a study section as well as an institute or center. And they also are responsible for organizing those study sections. Now, the big difference is that the institutes and centers at NIH are organized by biological systems and disease states while the Center for Scientific Review organizes study sections by scientific discipline and technology platforms. Uh, so, you know, there's the uh, National Cancer Institute, National Eye Institute, Heart, Lung, and Blood. But then on the study section side, those are more like diagnostics and treatments, medical imaging, cell and molecular biology. So we'll take a look at some of those study sections in just a minute. But that's the difference. Now, CSR uh, is responsible for evaluating the scientific merit of the application. When it goes back to NIH, they are then responsible for making the final funding decision. But that funding decision is made based on the CSR review. You can request a study section uh, as well as assignment to an institute or center, um, but you don't have to. Um, they will make that assignment for you automatically based on um, your abstract and title and, and um, potentially the first page, your specific aims page. If you choose to make a request, um, you can do so by using an, a form under the optional forms on the assist in the assist packet. Um, I would say that there are uh, good and bad points to requesting a study section. Sometimes it's super effective. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's better to let them assign. Just like everything in this process, it's just a total crapshoot. So um, you just need to you know, weigh the options carefully and, and investigate it. Um, SBIR has standing study sections. So if you go into CSR, which we will do together in just a minute, and you search study sections. If you are a faculty member who previously has research grants that are reviewed by study sections, odds are um, you're gonna have to pick a new study section because you're going to have to include SBIR in your search criteria. So the, the previous study sections that you've had for your R01 or R21, they do not apply to SBIR. There are sometimes that special solicitations, if you're applying to something outside of the omnibus, that they will put together a special study section just to deal with that solicitation. So what you're looking at here is a list of some of the standing study sections for SBIR, which means they're always, they're always going on. The review panels for SBIR are intended to be made up of both um, commercial and uh, researchers, commercial folks and researchers or industry. Um, so it's about 25% industry or commercialization folks, um, 25 to 50%, and then the rest researchers or clinicians. Generally speaking, I'd say it's closer to about the 25% mark, but some study sections have up to 50%. Also, there's a... Um, a NIH has shared a, a statistic that um, many of their reviewers are considered new. So previously, um, a couple of years ago, there would be reviewers who would be on study sections for long periods of time. That's really not the case so much anymore. Um, the bulk of reviewers are rolling off and on on a regular basis. So there's always lots of new people. Uh, so why would you want to request a study section? Well, a really good example is um, if if you have a technology that, um, and this this is a, based on a true story, we had a technology that was designed to, um, it was a clinical decision support tool um, designed for the use in nursing homes and long-term care facilities, um, and specifically for patients who have Alzheimer's and dementia. <laughs> so the application um, originally went to a study section um, that was focused on uh, clinical decision support, um, and um, it, it didn't go over very well because they were hung up on a lot of sort of the technology piece. Um, and so then we selected another study section and it was more favorably reviewed. So if you have a technology that sort of straddles two sides, um, you might look at different study sections and see where it can land. There's a couple of different ways to choose your study section. Um, NIH has its own tool. One of my favorite tools that NIH has that's called Reporter. 
It's also the repository of all of their data. You can search funded abstracts, all kinds of things on Reporter, but you can also get recommendations for study sections. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see the assist referral tool. tool. Um, it's called ART, and that's Center for Scientific Reviews tool. I will tell you when I was preparing my slides for, the, for this, I took a couple of abstracts of proposals um, and used ART and dropped in the abstract um, and then saw what study sections they recommended. Um, only about twice out of five were the study sections actually the study sections they were assigned to. <laughs> so I'm not sure how accurate the ART tool is. Um, and then the, finally, the way to do it is with manual search. Um, and so we are going to take a look. I'm going to um, switch screens here, and we are going to take a look at doing the manual search. So to find the study sections, the best thing to do is really just Google um, SBIR NIH study sections, and you will come to this page. This is the landing page. Now, these are all, again, the standing study sections. So these are the ones that are ongoing on a regular basis. There is some, um, we're going to look at this one, which is really popular. Um, and sometimes there might be like MSOS 10, 11, 12. Um, but in this case, there's only one. But sometimes a particular study section may have multiple groups. So this is what the page looks like for a, a study section. It gives you the scientific review officer, and we'll talk about this position in just a minute. Um, it gives a little bit of overview of what they're interested in. Down here are topics, and so you can kind of read through these and see if this aligns with your technology at all. And then the most interesting part is shared interest and overlaps. So this is going to tell you other study sections that may be relevant. And this is where we sort of find those nuanced differences between the two study sections. Um, one might be more focused on software and one might be more focused on diagnostics. Um, so this will just give you an idea. And then you can go visit all of these study sections and look at them as well. Now, the part we're most interested in are these lists of reviewers. Now, these are rosters from previous uh, meetings. You, you cannot see in advance the list of reviewers who have been recruited for in individual study sections. But what we can do is look back historically and see the kinds of people that have been on a study section. So when you click on that, it takes you to the roster. Now, we're not interested in contacting these reviewers. That's against the rules. Um, what we're really interested in is looking at what their areas of expertise are in. Is it heavy on the clinical side? Is it heavy on the researcher side? Um, is it, for example, um, you know, is, is it somebody who, are there lots of folks who are in um, uh, the, the technology side versus the patient care side? Um, so you can just kind of look at their individual um, positions and see what they're interested in. So here's an orthopedist. Um, here's a, somebody in the dental school, um, another orthopedic surgeon, biomaterials. Um, let's see what else, Im immunology. And then there's some, some corporate people. Children's research, so there's somebody in PEDS. So th that's a great example. If you have a technology that has something to do with pediatrics and you're not seeing a lot of PEDS on a particular study section, you might take a look at some other ones. So we just look at that roster. Whoops, I've lost my tabs here. And then we go back and look at the, the other previous one. Ooh, that doesn't have anything. Shoot, those other rosters aren't there. That doesn't make for a very good example. At any rate, we're looking for trends. We're looking to see if, if certain reviewers repeat, if the dynamics or the makeup of the review panel is the same. If so, then this might be the review. If it's what you think you need for your review, this might be a good section for you. Uh, a great thing to do is make a list, do all of this research, make a list of two or three study sections that you think are hot targets. And then when you talk to your program officer, ask for feedback from your program officer about those individual study sections. They, they should have a pretty good sense of those study sections and um, their appropriateness. Not always, but, but they should. Okay, Sherry, any questions about um, 
finding study sections or any questions in chat? I don't see any yet. Mm, okay. Let's see if any come through here really quick. Going once, going twice. Boom, sold, move on. All right. <laughs> All right, we're on to the peer review process. So once your application has been assigned, um, the scientific review officer uh, is responsible for building your review, the review committee. So um, you can see on the right hand side, here's a list of the scientific review officer's responsibilities. This person is different than your NIH program officer. This person lives at CSR, not at your NIH institute or center. So I tried to do a little flow chart up top in the right hand corner to show you that um, I can't even see it because that stinking bar is there that um, the SRO is the, the position we're talking about now. They live at the Center for Scientific Review. They recruit and build the study section. The study section or study review group is then headed by a chair, a member of that group who takes on the responsibility to organize the committee and run the meeting during the study sec, the actual day of review. Um, your application is then assigned to a primary, a secondary and a tertiary reviewer. Your primary reviewer is assigned to lead your discussion during the review process. There are lots of other reviewers on the panel. We saw the roster. We saw how many reviewers there were in a review section. Um, and they are welcome to read your application and comment on it, but they're not, they're not totally responsible for, um, committee, for participating in that review. Then off to the side, up at the very right-hand top corner, is your NIH program officer. Now they can come to your study section. Um, and in the old days, um, they would go to your study section. That was part of their job responsibilities was to go to the study section to hear their proposals get reviewed. Um, they no longer do that. They don't have to do that anymore. Um, they are often overburdened already with other tasks. Sometimes they do, but they don't always anymore. Um, so you can ask when you call and talk to your program officer, you can ask them if they were at the study section, if they had any additional feedback. If they're there, they are not uh, engaging in the review process. They're merely there to listen and observe, and then they bring that information back to you. Again, nine times out of 10 anymore, they're not there, but occasionally you might get some old school program officer who still likes to go or has the time or, or whatever. So back to the SRO responsibilities. Um, they, again, they organize the review panels. They manage conflicts of interest. You're also allowed to list names of individuals who have perceived conflicts when you are, um, when you agree to sign, to be a reviewer for NIH, you are asked to disclose conflicts. Um, if you receive a stack of proposals and you have an engagement with somebody in that stack of proposals, you are responsible for sharing that conflict with the SRO. Um, they assign the, they're responsible for making the assignment of the reviewers of, of the primary, secondary, and, and tertiary reviewers. They do not keep track of that, generally speaking. So um, that's important for you to know when we talk about re resubmission later. You know, the odds of your application being submitted again, the study section having the same roster, and you being assigned to the same primary reviewer, those, those are very low odds. Um, it could happen, but um, it, it's very low odds. Um, and then they attend that meeting, that study section meeting, and sort of oversee the, the um, administrative, administrative aspects of the, the meeting and um, make sure that you know, all compliance issues are, are um, followed. They then prepare the summary statements for the applications reviewed. Um, now, um, they previously sort of did a little bit more oversight to those reviews in the assembly and there's less oversight now. Um, that's not that big a deal, except for there have been some review comments that have come out that were not necessarily, um, probably should have been edited by the, the SRO and they weren't. So you may see some things that you're like, how on earth did this get out? That it, again, everybody's time is just, everybody's short staffed as we know. Um, so let's see, as I mentioned, the RFA or the um, Funding Opportunity Announcement, FOA, will let you know who's responsible for peer review, either the Center for Scientific Review or NIH in-house. Um, and we're talking about all grants here. So even though NIH has one contract solicitation per year, we're talking about only grants. 
Um, the RFA will also provide a full description of the review or scoring criteria. Now for the omnibus and for most NIH grants that focuses on five scoring criteria elements, um, significance, approach, innovation, environment, and um, uh, team members. Um, the review panels are organized, as we, as we mentioned, by the scientific review officer. Now, each one of those review panels, the members also have responsibilities. I talked about they have the responsibility to declare conflicts of interest as they see them. Um, they receive access to the grant applications about six weeks before their actual meeting. Um, they are asked to prepare written critiques for each application based on that review criteria um, and judgment of the scientific merit. They're asked to assign a numerical score to each of the review criteria, and then they make recommendations um, and, and award uh, points to those individual scoring criteria. Um, there are other elements that are not scored, and we'll look at the individual scoring criteria in a minute, but um, what one thing that reviewers are not, uh, they are provided with a link to the solicitation um, but another thing that you'll find in the summary statement sometimes is that reviewers don't always know all the rules of the program. Um, and so sometimes it's important that if there's sort of an uh, um, obscure rule and you're, um, you know, going to, for example, let's say, for example, using um, vendors outside of the United States, generally that's not permitted in SBIR and generally not permitted with federal funding at all. But if for some instance you have you know, secured a, um, a collaborator in um, Egypt who's the world's leading you know, AI expert, you may mention in, the, in your application, um, although rarely permitted in the SBIR program, a special exception has been made or whatever, um, because reviewers don't know all the nuances of the program. So that's really important to remember. Um, they have varied levels of experience and knowledge, including about your technology. Um, so that's why NIH typically recommends that you write your proposal on an eighth grade level. And that's like a New York Times eighth grade, not your local paper eighth grade. Um, but they, because they have this varied level of experience and knowledge, and we don't know what that knowledge or experience is. So it's your responsibility as the author of the proposal to make sure that everything can be easily understood. Again, the membership of those SRGs include uh, clinicians, researchers, commercialization experts, industry leaders. Sometimes those folks are retired. Sometimes they're really active. It just depends. Um, and they have that designated chair to serve as the moderator. Um, as I mentioned, the, the applications are assigned to three reviewers, a primary and two secondary, two additional reviewers. Uh, before the meeting, the reviewers confidentially submit this preliminary scoring critiques and assign a preliminary score. That score, the overall impact score, is then uh, used by the SRO uh, to uh, generate a list of proposals that will be discussed. At that time, about the bottom third to a half of proposals are knocked off, which means they're not discussed. All of those proposals will still get written feedback in the form of summary statements from three reviewers, um, and but you will not receive a score. So what happens next is the SRO then takes that list of remaining applications, the ones that whose score sort of made the cut with their scores, and um, puts them in a random order for discussion. Um, they at the meeting, it's typically a one to two day meeting and they typically discuss each proposal for about 15 minutes. Once again, there's the opportunity for applications whose scores don't muster up to be dropped and not discussed. Even if your application made it to the actual live meeting, for example, your primary reviewer may say, you know, may really like this application, but then the secondary reviewer may have scored it very poorly. And through a quick discussion, everybody agrees, you know what, we have a lot of other high quality proposals right now, we're going to toss this one, and they don't discuss it. Um, discussions of the application is led by that primary reviewer, um, and then the secondary and tertiary reviewers uh, sort of share in that discussion. Again, others can participate, but typically those are just sort of ancillary comments and not really driving the discussion. 
written sum summary statements are provided uh, for all applications that are reviewed, either those that are discussed and scored or those that are not discussed and scored. Um, and impact scores are assigned, and we'll talk about the impact score in just a second. SBIR does not utilize the percentile scoring uh, that NIH uses for other research grants. So if you um, have other NIH funding, um, you, re you rely heavily on that percentile score and the SBIR program does not use that. Um, NIH does use a nine point rating scale where one is exceptional and nine is poor. So scoring is, um, on, again, on those five criteria, the significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. There is other criteria involved, but it's not scored. So they're asked to consider, for example, your human subjects. Is it appropriate? Is the budget appropriate for the work proposed? Is it fair and reasonable? Um, they're asked to consider your um, use of um, key biological and chemical agents or select agents. Um, and they're asked to comment on a couple of other of your resubmission. They're asked to comment if you appropriately addressed previous submission comments. But those, those uh, categories are not actually scored. It's only the five main criteria that are scored. An overall impact score is also assigned. Again, they, they assign that impact score when they're reviewing the applications before they meet as a group. Um, and that's a tentative score that can be changed. And then they assign that impact score um, during the meeting. And the impact score, the overall impact score for your application uh, is determined by calculating the mean score from those three reviewers' final impact scores and multiplying it by 10. So as an example, if um, you know, the mean of all three reviewers' impact score is a 3.2, then the proposal's impact score becomes a 32. Now, the impact score is not a numerical calculation of the five scoring criteria. Um, people often look at the five scoring criteria, the scores for those criteria, and try to add it up and get the impact score. It doesn't work like that. The impact score is just considered a gestalt of the, the individual scoring criteria. So they may almost closely align because they're using that information to develop their impact score, but it is not a numerical cal calculation. Um, no single review criteria is more important than another. Now, a particular reviewer may place a, an emphasis on one over the other, which is how we sometimes get a real uh, range of scores and particular scoring criteria. Um, but from NIH's per perspective, it's not like your um, reviewers are told to weigh the approach section more than the investigator section. They all weigh equally. Let's see, may score very well in individual categories, but worse in an impact score. That, that frequently happens. Um, impact scores can also kind of have involved in them um, some of those other elements that are not part, part of the five scoring criteria. So, you know, you may do fairly decent in the five scoring criteria, but let's say you totally blew human subjects and it just really irritated your reviewer. You might find an impact score that seems a little bit lower than what, your, um, what it should be based on your, your individual scoring criteria. Um, applications that are not discussed, and, and we'll look, we'll see an example of this, receive um, a little plus plus sign instead of an impact score on your summary statement. Here's uh, reviewers are provided with this information about how to categorize their scoring um, and how to use that nine point scale. They can categorize feedback in minor, moderate, or major. And you'll see this sometimes on study, on uh, summary statements, they'll say moderate. Uh, moderate, you know, as far as uh, um, weakness, moderate weakness, X, Y, and Z, or um, minor weakness, X, Y, and Z. And so it helps you if you're going to resubmit, kind of know where to really focus your attention. All right, any questions in chat, Sherry? Not yet. Okay. I think they're just, I think they're just very intrigued, Chris. You're providing <laughs> great information here. You've got them locked in. Oh, yeah. All right. So once your um, application has been reviewed, and, and by the way, you can watch your application move through the process in, e, in ERI Commons. So when you submit your application in ERI Commons, once it's assigned to a study section, um, that will show up in ERI Commons, as will the assignment to the Institute and Center. 
and a preliminary, sometimes a specific, but usually a preliminary review date is placed in your ERA comments um, on, on the page for that application. It might say, for example, March 2023. As that review panel gets firmed up and the actual review dates are scheduled, that will change and you'll be able to see the actual review date and it'll change to like March 23rd or something. Once that date has passed, within a few days, um, your score or lack there of a score will be posted in ERA Commons. It usually takes about three to five days from the time your study section meets um, and you can go in and see a score or again, not a score. So once the review is complete, one of two things happens. You're either scored or not scored. If you're not scored, your application is definitely not getting funded. There's no way that application will be funded. An NIH program officer cannot pick up an unscored application and fund it. Now, if you're scored, there's a couple of other things that happen. Um, you're either not in a fundable scoring range you're in a fundable scoring range or where most applications fall is in the gray area of scoring. Once you have your score, you're gonna to have to wait about another two to four weeks to receive copies of your summary statement. The score alone often doesn't tell us anything um, as far as resubmission. The score or lack thereof will tell us, you know, whether you're, you're um, still in the process or not, or, um, but as far as resubmission, before we make a decision about what comes next after we receive your score, we have to wait for the summary statements. The other part about the summary statements is, um, you know, you can't reach out to your program officer until after you've received your summary statements. The posting of the summary statements in ERA Commons completes CSR cycle. So when those um, applicate, when the summary statements are posted in ERA Commons, that means the application has moved from CSR back to ERA, back to NIH, and it's in their hands now. Um, before that, it's still considered to be at CSR. Um, for, from the perspective of if, a, if another funder asks you if you have any applications pending with any agency, um, the cycle, again, is not complete until those summary statements are posted on ERA Commons. So is your score fundable? Well, it depends. It depends on the institute or center. It depends on the deadline or timing of the federal fiscal year. It depends on the current level of funding or the already allocated and awarded funds for a particular institute and center. And it depends on your relationship with the PO, with the program officer and the institute and center, and how bad they want the technology. Um, NIH uses a, a methodology called pay lines, if you're familiar with that. So they sort of set the score that is the, considered to be the pay line. Scores above will get funded, scores below won't. Now, there are some people who sort of try to play the pay line game and you know, do a lot of research to figure out which institute and centers, what their individual pay lines are. But pay lines are a moving target. And so it's not the only thing to consider when selecting an institute or center. And we sort of talked about this in the previous workshop. There's lots of factors that go into choosing an institute and center or a study section for that matter. Um, so pay lines are a moving target. Now, when we look at a score of, for example, 48, I'm not aware of any institute and center that would fund a proposal that receives an impact score of 48. Uh, an impact score of 15 is almost, I would say, almost guaranteed fundable. Um, I can't imagine that it wouldn't get funded, but I don't ever say something's funded until we have the notice of award. So a 15, is a pr I'd be pretty confident you're going to get funded. But a score like a 28 is in that gray area. Um, and so that's when we have to wait for the summary statement and then reach out to the program officer and get a sense. Even then... Um, your proposal may appear to be dead in the water, um, only to be picked up at the end of the year by the program officer. Um, I tend to work a lot with um, National Institute on Aging, and they are notorious, maybe not notorious, they are um, well appreciated for this process. When it comes time to the end of the year and they still have money in their kitty, they dip back and pull proposals that were scored lower, were not funded, <clears throat> but that they're interested in or that they have a relationship with the PO. 
So I've seen proposals at uh, NIA, NIA with scores as low as a 32 get funded. Um, that would not happen at cancer, National Cancer Institute. You have to have a score of uh, 20 or higher <laughs> to be even in the funding range at NCI. <clears throat> Cherry, it looks like we have quite a few questions in chat or is that just chat? Sorry, I'm on mute. We did, okay, so we got it. We we have a few. I've been putting a lot of information in there for other okay. people. Well, so but we do okay. have someone that says, um, <clears throat> "Great slides and talk so far. Can you please provide the links that summarize scoring along with process timing?" So is that something we can pass along in a follow up email? Um. Yes. Okay. Yep. And just to answer about um, for everybody, because I'm getting a lot of the same question, we will share um, archives um, to the, the video archive. And um, Chris, if you, with your permission, we can also share access to view access to the PDF of the slides. Yep. Okay. And then specific to what you're talking about, um, James Martin asked, do you need to disclose pending applications if they are not for the same research? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> most of the time they're only interested in if you have pending applications for the same or related research. <clears throat> um, they're pretty clear on the forms that that's what they're looking for uh, because you, can, you can't accept, and it sounds like he knows this based on his question, you can't accept an award for the same work from two different agencies. Um, so right. if you have overlapping proposals, you need to disclose that. If you have a proposal pending with NSF for something completely different, you don't need to tell them that. Oh, okay, good to know. One other question before you move on. Um, Jane Lynn asks, what approximate date is, an, in quotes, end of the year? Oh, oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm talking, I'm referring to the federal fiscal year, which ends September 30. Yep. There's so many different ends of years in this yeah, world. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I should have covered that. Um, so so when, when, uh, when federal agencies are reaching about August, you know, they might start dipping down to unfunded, to previously unfunded proposals and pulling them out to, to get them funded, to spend their money. I'm sure you all know the federal government, if you don't spend it, you lose it. So, um, you know, most federal agencies tap out at zero by the end of the fiscal year. And, and that's all we have right now. Awesome. Okay. So this is a look at a um, actual summary statement. And um, I pulled this off of NIA, um, National Institute on Aging, has examples, several institutes and centers have examples of sum summary statements. Um, so you can look at those and they've redacted some key things, um, but we can figure out what's on those. Um, so this is the front page. This is the top front page of a summary statement. Um, up in the right-hand corner, no impact score received. If that was the case, you would see those two little plus marks right there. Um, that's the plus plus that we're talking about that indicates you did not, you were not scored. If you are not scored, again, that means your proposal was not discussed in the study section meeting, but you will receive summary statement with written summary reviews from at least three reviewers. If you have an impact score received, you can see in the bottom box, that's what it looks like. The impact score on this one was 20. That's a, that's a great score. Um, other important information on this page, um, the review group. So you can see highlighted in orange here, this is the group that it was sent to. Um, and so you can, if you requested one, you can look and see, or you can go and look at the previous uh, rosters for that, that meeting. You will have a complete roster of your study section at the end of your summary statement. So they will give you a roster of everyone that was there. They do not tell you who your primary, secondary, and tertiary reviewers were. Sometimes you can guess, you can infer based on comments, um, but I think that's really dangerous because um, most of the time you're, you're probably gonna be wrong. Um, and then the program contact up in the upper left-hand corner that's redacted, um, that would be your uh, NIH contact, your program officer at a particular institute and center. So once you want to discuss your summary statement, that's the person that you reach out to. Um, okay, here's another one with a little bit uh, less information redacted. Um, again, there's the study section. Um, 
your application number is up top. Um, and that's really important when you do reach out to the program officer or anytime you have any communication with anyone at NIH regarding a proposal that's been submitted and reviewed, always include that application number in the subject line of your email. This received an impact score of 45. Um, and you can see here are some of those areas we talked about that they are asked to comment on but are not scored, um, human subjects, uh, vertebrate animals, um, minority and, and children, those are all parts of human subjects. On scored applications, the very first thing you will see in the summary statement is the resume and summary of discussion. Now, this is exactly what it sounds like. It is a summary of the discussion that happened during the review meeting, during the, the study section meeting. If your application is not scored, you will not have this because your proposal was not discussed. In the event that you decide to resubmit, this is the first place you should look at for things to address in your resubmission because this little paragraph right here represents uh, things that reviewers generally agreed on. So this was the consensus of the study section of your, your reviewers was in this, this summary of discussion. So you'll see very um, sometimes very opposing um, comments from reviewers and opposing scores, wildly varied scores and, and comments. Um, and so there's a lot of things that are inconsistent. Sometimes you might not be sure which, which uh, comments to address. Well, if you've been scored, this is the first place you look for things to address. These are the most important comments. And then you're going to receive at least three written critiques from your reviewers. Um, and this is an example of the first reviewers. Now, um, critique one, what they did was, and, and this will be the same for all reviewers, you'll see the five scoring criteria and the numerical score assigned to each of that criteria. Then the reviewer will provide a statement of their overall impact. This is also sort of a summary of their individual review. So this is different than the resume and summary of, the, of discussion. This is sort of their individual. Um, they typically try to provide a little overview of the project where you can sort of see that they understand the project appropriately. Um, and then it gives some more specifics. Like here he says, distracting from these strengths, the enthusiasm is reduced by a lack of clarity on existing solutions for measuring agitation, a fragmented project team, and concerns on the viability of the system, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Chris. Uh-huh. <clears throat> we had another good question rolling. Is this a good time? Yeah. OK. So um, this, so Jerry asks, and this is like, if you're in that gray zone that you mentioned, right? Yeah. So does discussing the summary statement with the PO have any effect on if you get funded or not? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I would I would say um, I don't it depends. I would say I don't have a solid answer on that. The reason that it does is because if your if your score is gray but still within range, and the PO, you have a discussion with your PO about your summary statements after you receive them and work through them, and we'll we'll talk about that process. But um, and you have a conversation with the PO and they understand, you know, look, we failed, we, we realized that, you know, we failed to really accurately discuss the, re, the um, inclusion criteria for our study, but here's what we're thinking. Sometimes they'll ask you to write a one or two page rebuttal. And what they use that for is if they want to try to still get your proposal funded, they can take it to council um, and sort of, uh, you know, try to, to um, I don't want to say argue, but lobby for your proposal to be awarded by council. Um, or if they have had a conversation with you and you're in that gray area, again, at the end of the year when they dip down to pick up projects, if they've had a conversation with you, they're familiar with your project, they, they know you know where you went wrong in the reviews and how you're going to fix those challenges, they may dip down and pick you up. Now they can't, we kind of talked about this earlier, but they can't dip down and pick up a 48. That's just too far. But you know, if you've scored in the 30s, they may be able to dip down and justify it. So in addition, it's just sort of customary to reach out to the program officer after you receive your summary statements to discuss them with them. 
So it's always a good idea. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Here's more scoring criteria, um, the investigators, the innovation, the, um, oh, he has innovation on there twice, interesting. Um, you can see they break it into strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes you'll see under weaknesses, it'll say major weakness, minor weakness, um, but here they didn't provide a lot of information about the weaknesses. That's because this proposal scored. Um, so that's a good sign. Approach and environment weaknesses and strengths. And so if you were going to do a resubmission, you look at those weaknesses um, and that's what you address in your, your revised proposal. Here's some of that other review criteria that I talked about, protection of human subjects, inclusion of women, minority and children, vertebrate animals, biohazards, um, budget and period of support. This reviewer recommended as requested Again, um, reviewers are asked to comment on if your budget is fair and consistent for the work proposed. Some things that you will see in summary statements, massive inconsistencies across scoring of reviewers. Um, the, the, you want to really focus on areas of consistency um, and areas that receive scores below two or three. So to get funded, you really have to have majority of ones and twos across the scoring criteria. Now, what I dropped in here for you to look at is this was um, the results of a resubmission. And the reason I think this is so interesting because if you look under reviewer one, under the previous submission, that was the first submission, they scored a two in significance. We revised the application and the resubmission received a six. So we went down four points. That's the wrong direction, but we have a different reviewer. So that's sort of the challenge. Um, reviewer two the, was consistent for significance and reviewer three was fairly consistent, even though those are different reviewer ones and twos from the previous to new. Those are those most likely not the same people. Uh, but you can see how varied the reviews can be. So reviewer two in the first submission gave approach a two. Reviewer two in the new submission gave approach a five. Now, I can tell you, we changed that application very little. So what changed was the reviewers' perceptions and what they focused on. Um, that's what changed, not necessarily the application because we changed it very little. It had a very nice score. We needed to bump the score up a little bit to get funded. Um, and, and the reviews came back worse the second time. The other thing you're gonna see in your summary statements are things that reviewers overlooked or misunderstood about your proposal. It, you will not make any friends by calling up the program officer and complaining that the reviewer didn't understand your proposal. That is your fault as the author of the proposal. Things weren't clear. Um, you didn't say it enough times or in enough different ways for them to understand. Um, you know, especially when people say, well, it, it's, it's right there. I said it in the proposal and it's three words out of a document that's more than 100 pages. Um, so they're going to overlook things and they're going to misunderstand things. And you need those are learning opportunities for you as, as the author. All right. Let's look at resubmissions quickly. Um, if you don't have a score um, you, a, and your summary statements, the reviewers are questioning the, the actual science they don't believe you or they're really questioning if what you're proposing is possible, if they are discouraging you for the market and the commercial potential, um, it, it's probably not gonna be a, a candidate for resubmission. Um, hey, yes. Sorry, uh, another question. Is reviewer one usually the primary reviewer? Yes, yes, okay. reviewer one's your primary, yes, exactly. Sometimes you'll get an occasional like reviewer four, just like some random stuck on there and they might just have a few comments. Um, but, <laughs> and the other thing that's really interesting is that the more the reviewers dislike your application, the more feedback they give you. Um, and so the more, usually the more opportunity you have to improve your application. Um, and when you really need the feedback is when you have a, a fairly decent score and you just need to get over the hump um, they, are, they are often pretty curt in their summaries, and so there's not a lot of information, but it varies. It varies from reviewer to viewer. 
If um, you have a fairly even mix of positive and negative feedback, even if you're not scored, um, and you feel like the negative feedback that was there can be addressed, even if it's scientific, you know, maybe since your last submission, you have new animal data that you can submit. Um, you know, anything where you think you can kind of get over that hump, then you should consider resubmission. You should definitely resubmit if you were scored and have a respectable, respectable score and you receive positive feedback that outweighs the negative. And of course, if you have a near funding score, um, definitely resubmit. Now, there's no guarantee that these resubmissions will come back with better scores than before. Those days are gone. Um, that used to be the case. It used to be a real gradual progression. As long as you were persistent, you worked your way up. Um, that's when we had lots of opportunities for resubmissions. It doesn't work like that anymore because all of those reviewers, so many of those reviewers are new on the panels um, and you're only allowed one resubmission. Um, reviewers are asked to consider um, resubmissions in an equal light to new applications. So they're not favoring those resubmissions as or looking at just the things that have been changed. They're asking them to consider them within the context of all the other proposals. But resubmission is almost always part of the game. So unless you just totally bomb and they don't believe it and it's not a good fit, and I've, I've certainly seen summary statements that come back like that, you will know them when you see them, then don't resubmit. But almost everything else is going to be a candidate for a resubmission because it, it's really a process of, of um, persistence. You can also submit as a new submission. So if you don't get a score and they're very negative, um, but you still are committed to the idea, you can go in as a whole new application. You don't have to do a resubmission. You're only allowed one resubmission per submission. Um, so if you submit, not scored, resubmit, not scored or not funded, then you're done. You can resubmit again, but it will be as a new application instead of as a resubmission. When you're thinking about resubmission, um, you really want to take some time to sit with your reviews. I, I literally can watch the five stages of grief happen with summary statements. Um, people typically email me really, really angry at first. And then I say, like, you know, sit with it. I, um, and I provide a sheet. The way I organize summary statements is by review criteria. So I break apart those uh, reviewer one, two, and three, and I organize, I put all of the review comments related to approach together, all of the reviewer comments related to environment together. So we can really see where the problems are. And when you do that, it's, it's actually a little bit um, easier to wrap your head around what the real problems are, and it's a little less intimidating. Do not contact the program officer while you're still angry. Um, wait until you can see some of the learning opportunities in the summary statements before you contact them because the, it's not gonna do any good. Um, appeals are almost never uh, uh, won in your favor. Um, you'll create more enemies than friends. Um, you just need to sort of take the reviewer comments and, and move forward. Share those uh, summary statements with your collaborators and um, other people on your team to get ideas. Um, sometimes I find that uh, principal investigators are reluctant to do that because they're taking those comments personally. It's not a personal attack. Um, so if you really want to move forward and improve your proposal, you need some outside input on, on how to do so. Um, for those reviewers are often right. Um, again, when you sit with it for a while, you can sort of start to see their point. Um, and then always talk through that resubmission strategy with the program officer. So once you have your summary statements, once you work through the five stages of grief, once you're ready to move forward with a positive attitude, then reach out to the program officer, tell them that you're considering a resubmission and you wanna discuss the strategy with them. Very, ask for a 15 minute call. That's the standard procedure. So they'll be, they'll be ready for that. So we had a couple more questions come in. And All I, right, I, let's I, take them. I think they're on similar topics. We'll start with the first one. So James okay. asks, is a new submission uh, your only option if the resubmission score was worse than the original submission? Ooh, yes. that sounds like who's on first? Yes. <laughs> yes. So the answer is yes. It's yes. your only option. Okay. Yes. So we have a little bit, we dialed down a little bit more specifically here. So Mehmet um, says for the April 5th submission timeline, for review schedule, September or December estimated award date? I think that's a question mark. What is the cause of the delay between these two award dates? The end of the fiscal year. Okay. Most, most of April will be awarded um, in that fiscal year. Okay. 
Yeah, um, Matt, did that answer your question? I know, I know you were probably trying to type this quickly, so I may not have captured your your entire intent. Thank you for uh, bringing up that question. I know it was a couple slides back, but my question was, I mean, September versus December, there's like a four month, three month period there. So if it's not included in the September criteria, then it's later this uh, at the end of the fiscal year, if there's more funding than December is considered, December timeline is considered? No, for? December would be new fiscal year. Um, oh. So they're busy wrapping up the fiscal year from September through December. Um, so that's what the, that's the delay. So if there's no um, and then they have to have a council meeting and there's no council meetings near the end of the year. So if you're not funded in September, um, it would be carried over to that December. But odds are if you submit in April and you're going to get funded, it's going to happen by September 30th. OK, thank you for that. Clarification. Yeah. Do we have other questions? I don't, I don't see any coming through yet. Okay. Well, that's really all I got. This is sort of a summary of what we talked about. Talk with the PO and um, you are allowed to per, uh, include a one page rebuttal um, to the points that reviewers brought up when you do a resubmission. Um, I would recommend that you find some of those online to look at, to get, um, you know, kind of best practices on what that looks like. Um, it should be very positive. Uh, focus on the changes that you made. Um, look at the SRO. They frequently make comments in the the um, review, the summary statements too. If there's like some egregious, like if the budget's way off or if they your human subject is wrong, the SRO will make comments on that. And then really to qualify as a resubmission, it's really a matter of checking a box on your SF424 on your forms um, and including the original grant number. That's what makes something a resubmission and it will unlock the box for you to upload that one page introduction. Um, just a, a quick note, reviewers have access to your previously your previous summary statements, but they will not have access to your previous full proposal. Um, so, okay, so before we go, so first of all, Chris, great job, man, Thanks. you, thank you. This was, this You're was welcome. definitely a deep dive. And I think that I love that you nerded out on it. And I know that you enjoyed <laughs> nerding out on it. I love and so, that too. <laughs> and so, and I think everybody else really got a lot of information out of this and you packed a lot into a short amount of time. We will be distributing your archives. Um, we have a lot on our plate, so it may take about a week. I do want to add that uh, many of you saw that we advertised a February NIH SBIR STTR sprint that's coming up four weeks in February. So Chris is going to be one of the training instructors on that, as is Shelley Maves, Heidi Platt, and Roland Garten. Now, while we while our full program cohort is full, um, if you did not have a chance to get in on that, we do have a virtual audit option, which pretty much offers almost everything the same, except there is no like assignment requirement and um, there you, you wouldn't receive individual feedback throughout the, the four weeks. So um, I'm going to pop a link um, into the chat. If you want to register for that virtual online audit, you are more than welcome to do that. Again, you'll have you'll have access to the to the live session. You can even ask questions. Uh, if you can't watch it live, you can watch it asynchronously. You'll have access to view the slides. You'll have access to the course portal and all of the resources. I mean, it sounds like a good deal to me, right? You just don't have to do the homework. You, yeah, I mean, that's how I want to, want to, to do it on your own. And then when you have a, a, a you know, a robust draft developed, reach out and request assistance um, from the yeah. Illinois FAST Center. We'll see if we can get you in, slide you in before that deadline. Oh, somebody asked in chat if the sprint is offered annually. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, depends. <laughs> De it depends a lot on um, funding and, and trainer availability. I think that would be ideal to offer it, you know, at least once per year. They do, there are three different um, omnibus um, submission opportunities. So we would, again, time it like we did this time. We thought offering it in February would, would provide that, that um, significant training and that proposal development process in time for the teams to then, you know, polish up what they worked on throughout the, th throughout the program and get it submitted by that, it's that early April deadline, right? Yeah. Right, Chris. So we we will we did an NSF sprint last September. Um, all resources 
you know, pending available resources, I think we would like to offer another NSF sprint sometime next year. So that would probably be our next priority. The good news is, if you did not have an opportunity to participate in the cohort, whether it was an audit option or the full program, we do record them. We do share the archives. So people who come to us seeking, you know, some more intensive um, training uh, before they can put together their draft, I can give them access to view the videos and view the slides and download the instructional materials. So we make that available throughout the year to those who are in need and it's free. You just reach out to me. My name's Sherry Soliday. I'm your concierge. I'm really good at it too. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Nothing like self-promotion, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, any other questions? Um, I see one that, that somebody asked if, if the, the impact score amount affects the amount of funding you get. It does not. Oh, I missed that question. I'm so sorry. That's okay. It does not. Thank you for so catching it. it it's it, you're either above the line for funding or below. NIH does reserve the right to negotiate your actual award amount um, if they're going to award, but it does not. Did you, I, and apologies, I didn't catch this. Did you address direct to phase two? No. Do they, does NIH have that? Yes. And is that any different no. as far as like, no, it's all the same, whether it's phase one, phase, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the only difference with phase two is there's a secondary review process focused on the commercialization plan once you receive your score from the the um, the, the Center for Scientific Review. NIH has, in addition to regular counsel, they have a, a commercialization review. Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm checking. I don't see any other questions and we are four minutes past our deadline. So thank you all for joining. Reach out to us for help. Bye. Bye-bye.